Thank you for tuning in. This is the Rice Crypto Show, and I'm your host, Rice. And on today's episode, my guest is somebody who I've been trying to get on the show for quite some time. Today, I am interviewing Dimitri Buterin. Some of you might know him as the father of Vitalik Buterin, who is the founder of Ethereum. Now, before we get into it, if this is your first time ever checking out any of my content, I do encourage you to explore my channel. Make sure you subscribe, smash that like button, go ahead and hit the notification bell so you can stay up to date with my videos as they come out. So we're just gonna go ahead and get right into today's video. All right, ladies and gentlemen, today's guest on the Rise Crypto Show is somebody who I've been actually trying to get for an interview for quite some time. And this is Dimitri Buterin, if I pronounced that correctly. And Dimitri, is, uh, as some people aren't familiar, he's actually Vitalik Buterin's father. So Dimitri, man, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show. How are you doing today? I'm awesome. Thank you. Yeah, man. And I mean, I know you don't do these interviews very often, so I, I feel very humbled that you're taking this opportunity to do it. And I know we do have some similar things in, in common, and we'll get into that. But for people who might be unfamiliar with who you are, can you kind of give us a little bit of a background on who, who Dimitri is? Sure. Um, grew up in the good old Soviet Union, or you know, good bad, or old <laughs> bad Union, whatever you want to call that. Um, and uh, was always interested in math and sciences, so I ended up going into computer science, studied in the Moscow for that and uh, worked for a few years and a uh, couple of companies before uh, starting on down my entrepreneurial path. So for the bulk of my life, my career, I've been a tech entrepreneur, so I've built a number of tech companies um, and uh, moved to Toronto 20 years ago and I've been enjoying living in Toronto ever since. Okay. And, um, yeah, so I have uh, my son Vitalik and I have two daughters uh, besides Vitalik. So that's kind of me in brief. And I, and I know family is a big thing to you, and that's something that we'll kind of get into here in just a little bit. But, I mean, you, you're kind of downplaying yourself. You have a really interesting background. Uh, I mean, you, you started three businesses that um, have been seven-figure businesses, one of which was an eight-figure business. I believe they're all software companies, and you decided to go ahead and sell them off, and now you're just kind of living life to the fullest, I guess you would say. And um, so, one of the ways to look at it, yeah. Uh, I know you went to school as. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say that um, we always live the life to the fullest, right? It's just like there are different ways to do it, right? And for about uh, when there were 20, 23 years, I've been doing it by building businesses. And then the next phase of my life was more kind of going inside and uh, doing lots more kind of self-reflection, meditation, and things related to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, that was some stuff I definitely want to talk about because um, you, you got some really interesting things that you're into, and those are some of the things that we have in common. Um, but what I wanted to ask a little bit about was, so you have a little bit, you have a background in computer science. You went to school for computer science. You learned about programming. You dealt with software. I'm curious because I don't. I haven't seen any information on the internet about this. Did you ever get involved in any cryptography or any of the cypherpunk groups or anything like that back in the early days? Not in the early days because uh, I was still in the Soviet Union, right? And uh, in terms of uh, technology, it was uh, really underdeveloped and was uh, disconnected from the world, right? So, like, actually. When I started going down the road of computer science uh, and I participated in some uh, programming Olympiads, a bunch of that stuff was done on paper. Like, they give you a bunch of uh, tasks and then you have to write down the algorithms by hand because there were no fucking computers. So, yeah. Right. Okay. That makes sense. So, okay. Now, um, with, uh, you know, Vitalik, your son, he, he grew up, obviously people knew at a young age, you and your wife included, that he was very gifted. Um, he started getting really heavily involved in things like math and economics and programming. And it sounds like you. So I'm wondering, like, did you have like any influence on kind of pushing Vitalik in some of these directions or was this something he did on his own? I believe that 
every human, they have their own natural uh, talents and capabilities, right? And in Vitalik, uh, like it, it's always a combination, right? There's your unique genetic uh, physical imprint, but then there's your environment. So in his case, those things, they kind of came together quite well. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I'm in computer science, his mom, you know, we met at the university, right? So she started computer science. Her dad is an engineer, very much into sciences and math and whatnot, right? So Vitalik grew up with a bunch of people when, the, when he was very young, you know, with people who were all interested in like in math and programming and computers and whatnot. And, you know, we gave him our old uh, uh, IBM PC when he was like, I don't know, four years old, right? And that was his toy. And he loved playing with Excel and doing all kinds of stuff on the computer. No, I mean, it makes sense. It's just there's, there's a lot. Of, I mean, it just seems kind of there's a lot of correlation there. So I just figured it was because, you know, and I'll get into something here, you know, in just a minute. But um, that I think is kind of kind of funny on my part. But um, did you now? I was curious how you got involved in cryptocurrency. And I read somewhere that you actually introduced Bitcoin to your son. Is that true? And then how did you get involved in crypto? Yeah. I uh, I always learn. I've been learning all of my life, and I constantly read books and podcasts and all of that stuff. And, uh, there was one podcast that I listened for like at least a decade, uh, and that's a podcast on the computer security and cryptography and whatnot. The guy, uh, what's his name, uh, Steve Gibson, and it's okay. uh, the podcast is awesome. It's called Security Now. He mentioned Bitcoin a long time ago and I got interested and I uh, did some research and I was very busy uh, running my business at the time. So I didn't really get involved in crypto, if you will. But I like, hey, Vitalik, you know, this looks like a really interesting concept. Check it out. Uh, might, might be of interest to you. And he really uh, got uh, curious about that and then he got really immersed in that. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And what, and what I was going to say to kind of get back, um, you know, I came up with this crazy theory before I started really researching you and finding out like who you were that you, you know, you being from Russia, I, I kind of figured you got into cryptography, you were into cyberpunk, maybe you even had something to do with the Satoshi Nakamoto group that, <laughs> that you groomed Vitalik to be who he is. You know I mean? It's a, uh, it's, it's if you really think about it though from an outside perspective i've come across, I've come across theories like that <laughs> yeah. so i mean originally that's what i thought i wish i had my private keys to billions of dollars in bitcoin right? <laughs> <laughs> that is just i mean that's why i say it's kind of crazy on my part but when i first sought you out for an interview that was kind of like the angle that i was going at was thinking that there's more to Dimitri than meets the eye. Like, no, and it's, you know, you're just a, you're just a regular dude. And, and, you know, you just happen to have like a freaking genius of a son, you know, but you yourself, you know, seem to be gifted as well. So now to kind of move on to some things that, uh, that we have in common, uh, I noticed on a lot of your social media accounts um, that you identify as an anarcho capitalist which would be under the umbrella as an anarchist and I'm an anarchist and I'm a voluntarist. So um, I'm just curious about your thoughts on anarchy, voluntarism, and in addition to uh, anarcho-capitalism. Right. Um, and they end of the day, they're all just labels, right? And we always have this tendency to want to put things into boxes and like, Oh, this is a nice box. We give it the label. And now we think that we understand the thing. And we have no clue, but, but again, like, for me, it's really about uh, uh, voluntarism is maybe the best label that I like about this whole space, because for me, it's really about uh, volunteering to enter into an interaction, cooperating, because I uh, abhor violence, and I don't believe that violence can lead to anything you know, productive and useful in whatever is context, whether it's like two people fighting or whether it's government forcing you know on the citizens their certain views that they have so i don't believe in that so for me it's really like how can we build a world where all as much as possible of our lives are governed by like you know i want this you want that let's talk let's negotiate let's see how we can benefit each other right so that's really the concept and uh also uh growing up 
I was heavily brainwashed by the Soviet Union propaganda uh, about the communism and socialism and all of this stuff. But it's funny because basically if you have some brains after all of the brainwashing, you look at the reality and realize, yeah, people talking about this stuff, but look at how we live here in the Soviet Union. And it's all totally corrupt. And people who are in the Communist Party and supposed to be all, you know, wonderful leaders, they are the biggest uh, fucking thieves and, you know, uh, the most corrupt yeah. people here. And uh, normal people are just living on peanuts, you know, like, so uh, it was very easy to see through that. And it definitely influenced my views on the political systems, right? Uh, and again, that connected also to my personal uh, view on violence and other stuff, right? So for me, capitalism uh, is a system that so far we have come up as the best approximation to building a society which is built on principles of, you know, let's talk, let's negotiate, let's figure out, you know, who, how we can both benefit from this. And people frequently com complain that capitalism is messed up, you know, look at their US, whatever. U.S. is not capitalism. It's uh, it's uh, chronic capitalism, whatever you want to call that, right? Like, right. it's really messed up. So for me, it's like, yeah, we as humanity, we went through a lot of experiments. I look at the experiments that uh, humanity had around socialism, and they all were horrible, horrible, killing tens of millions of people in China, in Russia, in Ukraine. Like, don't even go there, right? And we look at capitalism, and it's bloody imperfect. Uh, there are a lot of uh, problems with the current, you know, flavors of uh, what we have. And again, they're very far from what I see as a free society based on the principles of voluntary interactions. But it's still way better than, you know, uh, Stalin's uh, uh, Soviet Union or the Mao's uh, China. So that's my view on that. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you bring it up like that. And, you know, I've heard you, I, I listened to your interview that you did with Jeff Berwick, and you talk a lot about socialism and you know, in a, t in a day and age right now where socialism is becoming popular amongst young people, especially here in the United States, uh, you move from the Soviet Union, which was a lot of people think more communist, but it was definitely more so socialist, socialist. And then you move to Canada, which is almost equally a socialist, but in a different way. Um, what do you think about the fact that socialism is starting to spread as a new political ideology amongst younger people nowadays? Um, I know that's a kind of a... Yeah, people are, obviously, I'm not happy with the current systems, right? Current systems are really messed up in many ways. And when we get, like, in my case, I was really biased by my interaction with their Soviet system, right? So I kind of, I'm biased toward going as far away from that as possible, right? So people who are growing up with the current system here, and let's say, let's say the United States and what they think is called capitalism, and there are lots of lots of problems with that. And they like, hey, what can be as far from that as possible? Oh, socialism, that sounds good, you know, and like um, and they've never really encountered that. And you know, what they've been taught in schools about the wonders of that, right? Like, or even take somebody like Bernie Sanders. He looks like a interesting guy in many respects, but when he talks about oh Castro's policies, literacy, this and that, and Castro was a guy who was killing gays and whatnot. Right. Not. Like, you know, for me, no political philosophy or ideology is worth life of a single child. So that's kind of my life philosophy. Yeah, no, it's just, I mean, I think it's kind of interesting. And since you kind of grew up in, you know, in Russia and experienced a lot of this, I just wanted to get your point of view, especially with it just becoming such a popular thing. It's almost become trendy, but, you know, what yeah. you said definitely makes sense. Um, you know, it's something else that I found really, really cool. Um, going on your website and I'll have links down below so people can check out your personal website and your Twitter account. Um, but I noticed you have your current focuses, which that's really one of the things I wanted to talk a lot more about um, was you mentioned in on your website that you're really into deep self reflection, healing, meditation, sharing, mentoring, coaching, and learning. Mm -hmm. And I know you're also a spiritual seeker and you were raised an atheist. So um, yeah, I would like to talk about, you know, some of the, some of the things that you're in your current focuses and why you think these are important, not only to you, but how they could benefit other people in their lives. Totally. Um, well, let me start with some high level stuff, but then you can direct me with more specific questions, right? Okay. And 
And you're right, you know, growing up, uh, it was, again, heavily brainwashed, uh, atheism and all of this, religion is bad, and this is how it's hurting people. Um, and I would probably still call myself an atheist, but uh, I used to have very heavy bias against religion and spirituality, and that has shifted a lot, right? Like, first, uh, I understood the difference between uh, organized religion and religion and spirit spirituality. They're all different things, right? And uh, now when I look at life, the way I think about this, end of the day, as humans, we all end up trying to optimize our lives to achieve the most, if you will, happiness, right? Mm -hmm. And the biggest question is like, what is the definition of happiness? Like, what is that? And uh, uh, our psychology has evolved hundreds of thousands of years ago, and evolution is a very slow process, right? So basically, our brains have not changed that much in the last 100,000 years, but the environment has, it's totally different, right? Like the way, yeah. we, the way we interact. So our brains are constantly misfiring, right? And, you know, that's why there are circuits on our brain that used to be triggered by, like, here's a tiger, let's run away. Oh, I have to do public speech. Oh, how scary, right? The same circuit. And obviously, one thing is... Uh, is a de deadly threat. Another one is, is nothing, but this is how our brain work, right? So, and that's how our brains uh, end up misfiring most of the time. We all are they trying to optimize it toward the survival and feeling good, but then they're seeking the wrong, the wrong things. They're like, oh, if I get this job, if I build this business, if I get this relationship, if I do this and that, then I will be peaceful and happy. And people get that thing, or, you know, they try to get the thing, first of all, with all the struggle, like, oh, let me really suffer and struggle, but until I get this thing and then I'll get this, I'll be happy. They'll get to this point and like, oh, for some reason I don't feel happy. But instead of realizing that, oh, my brain tricked me, they're like, oh, my goal was too low. Like, I actually need to build the business, which is not like whatever, millions of revenue, but it should be a billion dollar business. And instead of this relationship, I should have this relationship, which is so much better then I'll be happy. And the process repeats for many years, right, until people have their, typically what they're referred to as midlife crisis, and like, oh, you know what, like I've been going down this road, they tried all those things, and they don't seem to be working. What else is out there, right? And this is basically when uh, people start the process, like, oh, is there a better, more direct way of achieving that internal peace and happiness than trying to achieve some external things, right? And yeah. that's kind of the path that I've been uh, on for quite a while, and especially the last couple of years, that's been uh, pretty much my 100% focus. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I can definitely relate to you. I don't get to put 100% focus into these things, but I'm definitely a spiritual seeker myself. Um, I, I, I believe we've been taught a lot of false information and misled and and try to, try to educate myself on things that I think are um, – things that I should be learning and know uh, as far as like our human history, um, the way that different religions and stuff like that started, um, where the roots came from. So it's, that was, that was the reason why I wanted to ask you. And um, so to kind of get a little bit more into depth um, with some of the things that you're focusing on meditation. And I would think that your deep self reflection would kind of fall into the category with your meditation. Can you kind of elaborate on, your meditation practices at all? Uh, sure. Yeah, I've been uh, interested in meditation for probably over a decade, and I tried it on and off here and there, and uh, and I've been uh, doing daily meditation for the last few years, and uh, currently I'm doing about a couple of hours of meditation a day. And my biggest uh, conclusion from that, like first of all, meditation is a wonderful tool. Um, one of the best techniques known to humans, or one of the best ways known to humans to actually go toward that internal peace and joy. Uh, it is a long-term thing, and uh, it's, uh, it's also a bit, a bit of a tro Trojan horse. It's like, you know, people start, oh, let me meditate so I can be more relaxed. So let me go to my shitty job and, you know, do this crazy stuff and be totally stressed out, but then I have my whatever, five, 10, 15 minutes of meditation day, and then I'm a little bit more relaxed. That's how it starts, and that's perfectly fine. But as you go deeper and deeper, meditation is really a path towards something much deeper to a very different understanding of yourself and life, and then your priorities, your views on, their, on, on your life, they shift. 
And in terms of meditation, so there are like dozens, if not hundreds of different uh, schools of meditation, right? From transcendental to mindfulness, to direct inquiry, to whatnot. And um, I now realize that there's no single best way for everybody. And, you know, a particular person, you know, became awakened, let's say, through a particular way, uh, method, and, uh, and now people can say, oh, he's different, and we want that. And they're all trying to kind of follow his path. And some people will follow his path, and they will also achieve that. But most people will follow his path, and they will not, because they're different people with different psychologists. So uh, I now believe that uh, it's really important for people to do a lot of heavy experimentation and try lots of different techniques, again, like transcendental and mindfulness and, you know, this and that and jhanas and whatever. There's, and there is uh, so much information these days, right? It's really uh, about just uh, dedicating a bit of time. It can be as little as a couple of minutes a day uh, and you start down this road and it's... Uh, it's a very deep and exciting and it's a journey with a lot of unexpected turns and twists uh, that uh, will take you deep down into yourself and the universe. No, that's, that's a great explanation. I appreciate you opening up about that too. Um, yeah, it's, meditation is something that I'm trying to practice more. I, I kind of get into those habits where I'll start doing it and then fall out and then try to keep, so I'm trying to become more dedicated and that was one of the reasons why I wanted to ask you about your practices. Mm -hmm. And um, another thing that we share in common, and this isn't for any type of recreational use, but I know that for a lot of mental health and a lot of your deep um, soul searching, um, you take advantage of things or you have taken advantage of things like psychedelics, psilocybin, MDMA, cannabis. Um, do you care to elaborate and talk a little bit about that? I mean, especially since you're living in Canada, which is pretty much... Um, you know, legal 100% now there as far as cannabis is concerned. And we're seeing um, places in the United States legalize psilocybin, like in Colorado. And um, I definitely think that they serve a lot of benefits for people's mental health and therapy. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, I'd like to you know, kind of get your point of view on some of those things. Sure. Um, again, you know, let me start maybe with my background. Growing up in Soviet Union, uh, I... Uh, uh, once again, brainwashed, like, you know, let's label those things drugs, and drugs are bad, so let's never kind of touch them because they fry your brain. That was my mindset for the majority of my life. And it's funny because in the meantime, in the Soviet Union, especially, and in the rest of the world, but especially in the Soviet Union, and the more in Russia, people just fucking killing themselves with alcohol, right? Which is the worst drug you can have. Right. You know? um, so I think about... Seven years ago, I came across uh, Sam Harris's book, Waking Up, which made a major impact on me uh, in many ways. And the subtitle of the book is uh, Spirituality Without Religion. So the book helped me see the difference, understand the difference between religion and spirituality. Uh, and also, uh, there was a chapter, fascinating chapter in the book about, uh, you know, those different substances and, and how they can be shortcut to 20 years of meditation, right? And, and my brain, like, what? Drugs? They're bad for you. Like, what are you talking about? Right? So after reading the book, I uh, did a lot of research for about a year. Like, oh, you know, here's this and here's that. And I realized that we've been all brainwashed and sold a bag of goods. And, uh, and it's really, and that changed my mind, right? It's been really rewarding to see in the last few years the plethora of books and, you know, uh, all kinds of other things coming out about this. I mean, you know, look at what's going on in the United States. The FDA, you know, uh, is going through their last phase of trial for MDMA, for PTSD, and many other things. And it's a uh, way, you know, it's incomparably better treatment for for that because, uh, uh, again, take the United States. There are so many veterans suffering from PTSD and many other things because of all those stupid wars they have been sent to. Right. And they come. The society like uh, is not really doing a good job taking care of them, and at best, you know, they given a bunch of pills, and that's a lifetime of suffering and just mentioned symptoms with very expensive pills, right? And with MDMA, so far in the first two phases of those trials, they have shown, uh, you know, I think, like 78% efficacy of uh, getting rid of uh, 
PTSD just after three guided therapy sessions, right? This is amazing, like doing things, you know, a few times versus a lifetime, costing you hundreds of thousands of dollars of drugs that constantly mess up your system, right? And uh, psilocybin, uh, their component in mushrooms, magic mushrooms, have been now signed a breakthrough therapy uh, status by FDA. Uh, uh, I think it's for major depression and uh, for some other uses, right? So I'm really grateful that finally uh, society is uh, changing stance, you know, after being brainwashed for a few decades about all of the things, right? In the meantime, we have all those addicts and people being prescribed opiates and people, you know, using alcohol and whatnot. And to the way I think about this, end of the day, we as humans, we use tools, right? And, and we use tools for different uh, purposes. End of the day, we, we all we use them to manage our emotions, right? And that's why as young adults, at some point we discover, oh, wow, alcohol, this is a very powerful tool to manage our emotions, to lose our social inhibitions, to this and that, right? But unfortunately, that tool comes with a lot of, uh, you know, downside, right? Mm -hmm. You can find better tools. And that is finally happening, right? So, and uh, I'm happy to see that uh, there are countries around the world are finally getting a little bit more sane about this. And Canada legalized cannabis. And it was de facto legalized for quite a while, or at least decriminalized for a long time here, right? And that's affecting other things. So I think that there is a... The current way we help people deal with mental and emotional well-being is very, very, um, how to put this, uh, ineffective and uh, it just prolongs uh, the suffering. And, you know, at best it manages the symptoms. And I think that uh, uh, there's a lot of really exciting research coming out of so many wonderful institutions from John Hopkins University here in the States to... Uh, a lot of stuff being done in the UK and uh, we are finding some new ways to support and help people going through the healing. And uh, that's another thing is also a big realization after kind of looking at myself, looking at people close to me, how much uh, stuff is accumulated in every single human being. We all dealing with a lot of trauma. Our systems were back when we were, ch we were children, we ended up being overloaded with certain traumatic events. And for some people, those events were worse, if you will, it was actual physical abuse or, or forbid rape and whatnot. But whatever it is, like if you're a child and there are many things that uh, that you have to learn to deal with and your system, when it's unprepared for the things, that it becomes a trauma, it becomes embedded in you and it becomes a defense mechanism, right? So we basically have billions of wounded, wounded people walking around the earth and they're all trying to deal with the symptoms of that thing you know they kind of sleep and they're trying to mitigate the symptoms with food with alcohol with all kinds of addictions and some addictions they are more improved by the society like you know let's uh, go all out and spend you know 120 hours a week working on stuff because that's a wonderful way to distract yourself from the pain you have inside but again it's like at some point you wake up and realize oh and what not now my physical being is all messed up because of all the ways I have not been taking care of my body, right? So yeah, I mean, uh, that's a huge area of uh, interest for me and I'm really uh, hopeful to see a lot of exciting developments uh, and new treatments, new ways for people to support their healing and transformation. Yeah, no, I think that's a beautiful thing. And uh, I mean, I, I love seeing this progress in the medical field when it comes to this, because there are a lot of people that are walking around just trying to find a way to, to, to basically alleviate the pain, to deal with what they had to deal with. And, and we do it in lots of different ways. So, I mean, I think that, you know, it's, it's important for us to progress as humans and start evolving and start thinking differently and not necessarily believing the things that we were taught and conditioned we're brainwashed with because obviously our governments aren't looking out for our best interests. And uh, I think it's important that, you know, people start to educate each other and we start to build that community factor. So, um, but yeah, I, I do I mean awesome wise words, man. Um, one of the last questions I wanted to ask you, I know that you've been a serial entrepreneur and an angel investor in the blockchain space. And I know you're extremely biased towards Ethereum. 
is there any projects in the space um, that you're currently excited about or that you're investing in that you think has a lot of potential that you want to share? Not really. And the end of the day, my biggest conclusion after a few decades and, you know, um, of my career is that at the end of the day, it's about people, right? And it's not about just smart people, but it's about good people, right? And if you look at Ethereum, if you look at Vitalik, people ask me all the time, are you proud of him? Of course, I'm fucking proud of him. But I'm proud not of the fact that he's smart. Like, there are tons of smart people, and it's a, it's a genetic lottery, right? But what I'm most proud of is how sincere and kind he is. And we all actually seek that. We all get attracted to that. So I went to Ethereum Denver recently, right? That's mm -hmm. a wonderful, the best Ethereum event, I think. Annual event in Denver, 2,000 people building all kinds of exciting stuff. And uh, all those, you know, scammers and people trying to make a quick million here with ICO and whatnot, they're gone from the ecosystem and people just building stuff. So... I look at the, for me, if you look at any kind of technology, there are all kinds of awesome technological ideas all the time, right? Vitalik came up with the idea of Ethereum because he was involved in Bitcoin, then he was looking at some of the other attempts, people trying to build those colored coins and other things, so then his brain is like, oh, you know, what if we take this and we combine it this way, here's the concept, and then other people came on board and they all making it happen. And other people now taking this and they're trying to improve it. And they will. This is how science, this is how humanity, how technology works. Right. But the thing is like, it's easy to come up with a technological idea. But then you actually, uh, your, how to put this, your success in life will be always a reflection of your internal world. I right? am a huge believer in that. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you have a community of people, let's say, when we look at something like Tron, looks to me like there's a lot of people who are the key, inter key interest is really to make tons of money quickly. That's yeah. fine. Right? And there are good reasons for why people are driven to do that. But again, you cannot create the right future if this is your goal. That can be like Vitalik has made quite some good money, but he only made it because he doesn't care about money. He doesn't care if he's got this much or that much. He just, he's having fun. He's building this. He sincerely cares about the community. So for me, every time I look at any kind of project, it's like, okay, what are those you know, people trying to achieve? Where is their heart? And uh, I see a lot of uh, awesome stuff in Ethereum. I'm keeping an eye out on many things, but if you look at their success or otherwise of many other projects, you know, you take Tezos, you take anything else, it's, it comes down to like the personalities of people, right? So yeah. that, that's what it is. And uh, I'm quite excited about uh, what's been happening in the, what they call decentralized finance. The DeFi, it's, yeah. DeFi, it's still very much very geeky space of many different things. But, you know, they talk about uh, those building blocks. They start talking to each other, they connect up, and something interesting is happening there. When I look at this, it's still, still very early on, but I see huge potential. And uh, now when people realize, oh, I can take my money, I can buy this, you know, crypto quasi dollar stable coin, right? I can put into this, uh, you know, automated uh, savings setup when I get 8% annual and I'm no longer subject to this crazy volatility of crypto, which is awesome when it goes up, but then it comes down, then I'm right. Like, right? So yeah, there's lots of pretty cool stuff happening. And if you're in Denver, lots of small, very practical, very interesting projects being happening. All in all, I kind of see a lot of, maturity in this space, right? Also, again, I'm biased and I know the most about Ethereum. Very excited about the progress on the proof of stake. There was a lot of hardcore scientific research and development, which is very uncertain, very difficult to do. So that phase of the journey is behind them, I believe. And now it's all implementation, which is still tricky, like any kind of software development is tricky, but it's getting closer and closer. And I'm really excited because when I look at kind of the whole mining space, it's not making much, much sense to me. It's like we burn energy to solve cryptographic puzzles. And it's fine, you know, that was what we came up with. And now we're trying to experiment with and people are trying this delegated proof of stake. And that seems to be uh, ended up in really bad spaces with a lot of uh, mess and corruption and whatnot. Right. Let's see if Ethereum is able to uh, build a new uh, version of proof of stake, which will not have those downsides. I believe they can. Life will tell.
No, I agree, man. And I think that we'll definitely see progress in technology. I mean, that's the whole point uh, is that all this stuff will grow. And, and hopefully, you know, some of the work that people like Vitalik and, and other people who have done will inspire younger people that can produce even greater technologies that will move us forward. I mean, that's the idea, at least. And, you know, I definitely know that what Ethereum is doing is a great thing. It's a big undertaking. They've got a great team of people working with them. A lot of people are building on and around Ethereum. And, you know, I mean, when we talk about progress and things about delegated proof of stake and, and moving from a, a proof of uh, a proof, the, having the, the mining with the proof of work and then going to proof of stake with Ethereum, you know, I mean, we, something I think is really cool with the advancements that we're seeing is I would like to see something move beyond that, but I like... Uh, a blockchain like Nexus, um, they're actually created a hybrid system which allows proof of work and proof of stake. And it's a pretty interesting system. Um, and it just kind of opens up a totally different level of governance and uh, ways for people to be able to accumulate and participate in the blockchain. So I think that's awesome, an awesome thing. And uh, Dimitri, man, uh, before we wrap things up, was there anything that I didn't talk about or anything that you wanted to cover or any final thoughts that you wanted to leave us with? Um, I mean, the key thought that I would love everybody uh, listening to this to uh, go away with is, is like, uh, is to look within themselves and kind of figure out like how much time are they spending like looking inside versus looking outside. And it's awesome uh, to get new knowledge and information and experiment and build stuff when I've done a lot of this and I will keep doing this. Uh, this is how humans moves forward. But also the key thing is for every human is to have the time when they are going inside, when they trying to, when they building a better picture of themselves. Why are they doing things? What's driving them? What are they still struggling with? And what are they paying? Where are they being drawn to? And uh, when a single human does that, it's not just uh, helping that particular human. It's actually like there are wide circles going around from that human to people around them to people around them and so on. And this is how we change the world. We don't change the world by, hey, let's have this awesome global initiative. Let's do it. It's like, start with yourself, you know, improve yourself a little bit. Other people do the same. And we all kind of go a little bit higher, a little bit higher. And within, I don't know, 10 years, we are way higher, right? So uh, supporting themselves and moving forward, that's uh, the future of humanity for me. That's well said, man. And it, it, it reminds me of something that I do and something that I try to push to people. Uh, it's kind of the basic uh, backbone behind everything I do. And I call it practice change, where uh, I, I try to be the change that I want to see in this world. The Gandhi quote, be the change you want to see. And I do that by practicing daily being a better person and learning from the good and bad, the positive and the negative, and, and just growing as an individual. And uh, and how all this kind of encompasses for me, especially with like incorporating things like anarchy and volunteerism and cryptocurrency and blockchain technology is if we're talking about changing the world and disrupting with these technologies, we're going to continue having the same problems we have as humanity with just new, new technologies. We need to evolve as well. So uh, I think it's time to have like what I call an evolution revolution where we start changing as, as human beings and, and getting to that point where we treat people how we want to be treated, which really comes down to like the heart of voluntarism. So um, if you don't mind holding on for one moment, I'm going to wrap things up. Uh, I'm going to have links down below, like I said, for everything we talked about in the interview. Dimitri, I appreciate your time. Ladies and gentlemen, if this is your first time ever checking out any of my videos, I do encourage you to explore my channel. If you like what I'm doing, you can support me by subscribing, hitting that like button, commenting, and sharing. And as always, I encourage you to be the change by practicing change, and I love you all.